Uh, so I'll uh, start the seminar now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the seminar. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah, all good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my name is Abdul Rahman, and uh, today I'll be talking about some of the antenna designs that we made for uh, end glacial and subglacial sensor probes and uh, supraglacial uh, surface receivers. So I'll start with an overview of the uh, project. So uh, this project is being done as a collaboration between UCL and British Antarctic Survey. So the idea is to uh, make some boreholes through hot water drilling into the ice at Thwaites Glacier Antarctica and then uh, load some sensor probes at different depths into it. And each of these probes will contain some sensors, including strain, tilt, temperature, and pressure ones. And they are going to gather this uh, sensor data and transmit it wirelessly to the surface receivers here. So a constraint that we have here is that uh, the diameter of this borehole can't get bigger than eight centimeter. And uh, we need to be able to communicate up to a maximum depth of 2,300 meters. So there are going to be like multiple probes here separated by around 200 meters. And they'll be sending their data wirelessly to the surface uh, receivers. And uh, there will also be a feature of receive and relay so that if a probe at a further depth can't directly convey uh, its message to the surface receiver, it can uh, relate to the one on top of it, and then it can relate to the surface in steps. So this is the overall project, and my research contributes in designing some antennas for the sensor probes here, as well as for the surface receiver, and at the same time answer some research questions uh, that I'll uh, mention at a later instant in the presentation. So the scheme of presentation is as flashed. I'll I'll focus a lot on the related works uh, that have been previously done uh, in this area, like similar projects, uh, especially mentioning the types of antennas they used for it. Then I'll mention the research questions uh, for my research. And out of the three antennas that we have uh, developed, I'll discuss the design and some of the experimental results of one of them. That is an Archimedean printed spiral antenna. And finally, some of the short-term future work that I have in mind. So this is an overview of the uh, previous works that have been done. So there have been actually three major projects uh, that are most similar uh, to the Thwaites project. So they are the GlaxWeb, uh, the wireless sensor system, and the electronic tracer or the e-tracer. And then there uh, have been some like one-off projects as well like the Black Rapids project and Moulin Explorer. So I'll discuss just a few of them and uh, keep my focus on these three. So uh, the GlaxWeb project started in 2003 and the idea was to develop a wireless sensor network that could be deployed in harsh environments like that of a glacier. So they developed some wireless sensor probes that were cylindrical in shape and they could house uh, three sensors, temperature, pressure, and tilt, and had an uh, omnidirectional dielectric resonator antenna operating at 433 megahertz. So these probes were deployed inside the glacier, and then they transmitted their data uh, wirelessly to a base station, and that was then relayed to a reference station. So the maximum depth that uh, they could achieve here was 80 meters. So actually for the Thwaites project, uh, we need to able, uh, we need a maximum communication range of up to 2300 meters. Yeah, so uh, that is, uh, so perhaps this equipment here might not be suitable for it because they could achieve only 80 meters. So another work the team did uh, uh, was that they improved their initially designed probes 
So uh, made them bigger and now they could house uh, multiple sensors. Previously, there were just three sensors, but now they have added uh, resistivity and strain sensors as well. And then they changed the type of antenna they are using there. So the frequency is same, 433 megahertz, but the uh, antenna has been changed from a dielectric resonator one to a helical antenna. And the transmitter power is increased from 10 dBm to 20. But again, the range that they could achieve was somewhat similar. So it was around uh, 72 meters. Uh, one of the work they reported, uh, they studied how the glacier uh, morphology changes during uh, different seasons, uh, winter, and how uh, the morphology changes when uh, it switches from uh, winter to spring, especially. And for this as well, they used uh, the, uh, their previously developed probes and the uh, maximum range they could achieve was 70 meters. So this was done at Brixdale Spring Glacier, Norway. Uh, so in another work that they uh, did in 2008, um, so they kind of uh, switched their operating frequency this time. So instead of using a 173, uh, a 433 megahertz, uh, they are now using 173 megahertz and different transmitters. So uh, this time the probes could house, so temperature, conductivity, light reflectivity, tilt, strain, and humidity sensors. So a total of seven sensors and a quarter wave helical antenna was used now. So uh, the configuration of deployment changed in this experiment, but so this time uh, they deployed some wireless probes up to 70 meters. And then there was a wide probe that was lowered like 10 meters deep. And this wide probe communicated with the rest of the probes at further depths. And something that happened during the, uh, their field deployment was that uh, this wired probe stopped functioning. And due to that, they couldn't communicate with the uh, wireless probes deployed further down. So this like proved a single point of failure. And to avoid a situation like this, uh, the Threads project uses the uh, receive and relay feature so that if a probe uh, further down can't communicate directly, it can relay it to the probe just on top of it. And then it can, the message can reach the surface in steps. Uh, the glass step stream also like uh, investigated the breakup of the brick stair spin glacier through their uh, through the probe experiments they did, and they combined it with some further experiments that uh, in which they used a ground penetrating radar and borehole video analysis as well. So these are some uh, some of the other applications they used their uh, developed equipment for. And uh, one work that they did in Iceland was that previously at this site, Vatna Jokul Glacier, uh, they couldn't have long-term deployment during the winter, but uh, they improved their energy, uh, like the energy efficiency of their equipment by making use of solar panels, wind turbines, and better communication protocols. And they were able to deploy their equipment there for uh, throughout the winter. And again, the maximum range achieved there was around 80 meters. Then again, at a glacier at uh, Iceland, uh, they did a study to um, see how the, like the uh, end glacial hydrological system behaves during different seasons of the year. And what they find out, uh, found out uh, was that during the winter season, since very less surface meltwater is generated, so uh, the glacier doesn't undergo much changes. And even when the meltwater is generated during the summer or the spring season, uh, most of it just goes down directly to the base and the ice body doesn't absorb it much. And 
the glacier base has a water content of around 2%. Yeah, so these were some of their findings from their work. So an interesting work that the same team did uh, a bit more recent, 2017. So in addition to these wireless probes, they deployed some wide probes as well. So uh, they called them geophones and the idea was to uh, record some micro seismic events that take place inside the ice uh, during uh, different times of the year. And they call these seismic events like as earthquakes and try to like identify the cause that is causing different ice quakes. And they were able to like classify the, uh, these micro seismic events into three categories and could relate them to the uh, underlying phenomena that's causing them. So this was an interesting work. And then more recently, uh, from their different experiments they carried out uh, over the years in uh, last year, they presented a generalized behavioral model for the glaciers in different seasons of the year. And what they said that uh, usually the glacier motion is stick slip motion. It means that the glacier slides for some time and then there is some uh, time of inactivity. So it's not a continuous uh, process. And that the glaciers are highly sensitive to the meltwater inputs. Yeah, so during winter, the, uh, the hydrological system is a bit inactive and there are not much morphological changes taking place because the meltwater input is very low. Uh, but during the uh, winter spring season change, so a lot of meltwater enters the glacier through crevasses and moulins and um, there are a lot of changes happening at that time. So this is kind of a summary of the glass project. So, uh, so different field experiments were done between 2003 to 2019. And they used wireless sensor probes as well as geophones. Uh, they basically used just two types of antennas for the probe. So one was a dielectric resonator antenna and a helical one. And three frequencies were used and the maximum range they could get was 80 meters. So the next work that I want to talk about is called the wireless sensor system. So it was actually a uh, quite nice work and uh, the equipment that the team had developed uh, could be used for the Thwaites project as well in some way. So the team did two experiments. One was called the Russell experiment and the other one Neem. Uh, the aim of the two experiments is different. So in the Russell experiment, the idea was to measure the temperature profile of different ice layers with depth, basically. And in the Neem experiment, they wanted to test the maximum range uh, of communication they could achieve uh, with the devices they had developed. So for the Russell experiment, uh, this is a picture of the wireless probe they had developed. And uh, it, it's uh, around a 30 centimeter long probe, five centimeter diameter and uh, it could just contain one, one sensor at a time. So it could be temperature, pressure, or tilt. And they used a coil antenna here, uh, which you can see here. And the, the frequency is quite low. So it's 30 megahertz with a transmit power of uh, 0.1 watt. So they had made two separate boreholes. So in the first one, they deployed 25 wireless probes 23 for measuring uh, the temperature at different ice layers and one for pressure and one for tilt at a maximum depth of 60, uh, 600 meters. And in the second borehole, a wide probe was lowered which contained temperature and pressure sensors. And for receiving the data from the uh, wireless probes on the surface, they had two kinds of receiver antennas. So one was a cross dipole antenna that you can see here. And the other one was a log periodic uh, dipole array. 
and the communication method was simple on off keying in which a, a high magnitude carrier uh, carrier meant a digital one and quiescence meant a digital zero so uh, in the russell experiment they could actually uh, successfully communicate uh, up to 600 meters depth yeah so the next experiment was the neem experiment and the idea was to see the maximum communication range in ice they could achieve. And for that, they had developed three kinds of uh, sensor probes. So the first one uh, was the same one that they used for the Russell experiment. In the second one, they increased the transmitter power. So previously it was 0.1 watt, and now it is a one watt. And in the third kind of probe, uh, the antenna size was also increased. So uh, how they did it was they put the three probes around a Kevlar rope and load it through a steel wire rope. And while loading, the reception was done with the cross dipole antenna. And while pulling it up back, the reception was done with the dipole antenna. Array. So in this way, they could like uh, see the efficiency of both of uh, both types of the surface antenna. And some like uh, very good ranges were achieved. So with the first probe, a range of 1700 meter was achieved. And with the sec second and third kind of probes, uh, they could get successful communication up to a range of 2500 meters. So these were some good results. So the same team uh, did another experiment at Kronbeen uh, Tidewater Glacier in Svalbard, uh, which is an archipelago uh, in, uh, in a Norwegian archipelago, yeah. So here they use some additional techniques as well, in addition to the uh, wireless probes. So they use photogrammetry and some satellite imaging as well. And the maximum range they could achieve was 320 meters here. Uh, but uh, like perhaps the capability of the equipment was quite higher as already demonstrated. So this was probably the range uh, like the depth of the glacier they were doing the measurements at. And the third important project um, was the electronic tracer or the e-tracer project. So this was a bit different uh, from the other two that I've uh, discussed. So it's like a spherical, so they made like spherical probes looks just like a, like a tennis ball maybe. And the idea was to um, load these probes through the uh, crevices and moulins from the surface of the glacier, and they would travel through the uh, flow path of the glacier water channels. And as they will travel, they will record the water pressure at different instants. And they wouldn't uh, transmit this recorded data to a surface receiver, but just uh, record that into their inbuilt memory and once they came out from a glacier portal, uh, they were detected. So uh, they used um, 151 megahertz frequency here and a 10 milliwatt transmit power. And they were detected using a Yagi antenna with two kinds of receivers. So this is a software defined radio, wind radio, and then an animal tracking receiver called Biotraxica. Work, uh, the team built uh, some improved versions of their initial uh, probes and they called it a uh, new tracer and creo egg. So the new tracer uh, used the same kind of antenna, uh, which is a helical antenna, but now had uh, a higher transmit power. And the creo egg was a bigger sphere and it could house multiple probes, uh, like multiple sensors. So the e-tracer could uh, only house one sensor, but CryoEgg could house multiple sensors. And it also had a larger transmit power. Again, the uh, reception was done with the same receivers and antenna, but this time uh, these probes could transmit wirelessly to the surface as they traveled. And for that uh, frequency shift king was used so it's plus minus 2.25 megahertz from the center frequency of uh, 151 megahertz. 
So they did three field experiments uh, with these uh, new A-tracer and CRUAG. And with the first experiment, they could achieve a maximum range of two kilometers. Uh, with the second experiment, similar range. And the third experiment was uh, in water actually. Yeah, so again, uh, so these could achieve some uh, considerable ranges twice. And a more recent experiment that was done. Uh, so here they developed another version of the original probe that they called ET plus probe, and it could house three sensors. It was a bigger probe and again used a helical antenna operated at 151 megahertz. But for the surface receiver here, uh, the autonomous face sensitive radio echo sounder was used and a wind radio G305 receiver was used with Yagi antenna. And the wireless range that was achieved was 150 meters. So these were actually, uh, the purpose of this experiment was to um, detect meltwater in fern. So like the snow passes through a transition state called fern before it becomes ice. And from the surface up to around first 70 meter depth, it's a combination of snow and fern. Yeah, so, and the purpose of this uh, field experiment was to detect the meltwater in the fern. So the three major projects already discussed, and these are uh, some of the other works uh, that are somewhat similar to the Twits project. So in the Black, uh, Black Rapids project uh, that was done in uh, USA, the uh, purpose was to see uh, what happens at the till during different uh, hydrological changes, uh, like different times of the year, and use this information to study the glacial behavior. So what they did was first made a borehole through hot water drilling and, and lowered down a specially designed hammer that broke through the till here, and then they put a a steel probe here. And a receiver was placed a uh, few meters above the eye still interface. And this probe uh, communicates wirelessly with this receiver. And then there's a wireless link, uh, a wired link to the surface. And this wireless communication uh, was done using a coil around a core a configuration that could generate a a uh, low frequency magnetic field here, and that would be sensed by a similar configuration here. So a 450 Hertz chirp meant a digital one and a different frequency chirp meant a digital zero. And so the second last work that I'm going to discuss was a Moulin Explorer. So it was somewhat similar to the uh, electronic tracer, except that it also housed a, a three axis accelerometer and recorded the location information as it uh, passed through the water channels in the glacier. And once it came out, it was de detected through a EDM satellite tracker. And the last work that I'm going to discuss is uh, so this team here, uh, including Lishman, so they tried to investigate if acoustic waves can be used for transmission through ice. So perhaps their inspiration comes from uh, acoustics being effectively used for communica communication in water. And what they found out was that if the glacier environment is very wet, then acoustics uh, like acoustic waves is a good idea. But for all the usual types of uh, like glacial environments, which could be uh, cold, small grained ice or large, big fractured ice, uh, the EM waves perform better than acoustic waves. So uh, this brings me to the end of the uh, previous works that I want to discuss. And so the research questions for my research are, uh, are cross dipole inspired antennas suitable for uh, wireless probe applications? 
So none of the previous works have used such antennas uh, inside the wireless probes. So this is something I'm doing in my research. And then uh, is 433 megahertz a suitable operating frequency for long range communication through ice? So in the previous works, they uh, used this frequency only for distances up to uh, 80 meters. And lastly, I'll be trying to develop some antennas and validate them for uh, surface receiver applications. So we have like developed three antennas and I'll be discussing just one of them. Uh, but before I go to that, so these are some of the link budget calculations uh, for this project. So we are using a Hope RF transceiver here that provides the maximum link budget of 168 dB. Uh, assuming that the surface receiver antenna can give a gain of 6 dBi, uh, we try to work out the requirements for the transmitter antenna uh, that, that will be inside the probe. So uh, the dielectric constant that is assumed here is 3.1 for ice. And if you go through these calculations, uh, initially the requirement for transmitter antenna comes out to be quite low, but uh, this is not uh, like a usable figure because if I like uh, consider the complete uh, link margin, then the data rate that I get would be quite low. So if I need a data rate of at least 4.6 uh, kbps, then the, uh, the requirement for the transmitter antenna will increase to around uh, minus 3 dBi. So we are like trying to get a gain of up to 1 dBi uh, for the wireless probe. It's difficult uh, because we have a big size restriction there. It's, it can't go bigger than uh, like 8 centimeter diameter because the borehole is so small and we are using a frequency of uh, 433 megahertz. So uh, today I'll just be discussing one of the antenna designs out of the three that we have developed. So this is a basic design of an Archimedean printed spiral antenna here. And uh, we will be using it with a quarter wave reflector so that all the energy is focused on one direction. Yeah, and because uh, we don't need a major lobe at the back. So the way we did the simulations was to uh, make a snow cylinder around it uh, and select the dimension so that there are at least two wavelengths in each direction. So for the simulation to work correctly. And some more things about this antenna design. So it's a self complementary design, which means that the width of the spirals and the gap between them is the same. And it belongs to the frequency independent antennas uh, because it has got a big bandwidth. So the innermost radius uh, corresponds to the highest frequency the antenna can support. And the outer radius corresponds to the lowest frequency the antenna can support. But actually for this project, we don't need this much uh, bandwidth. So uh, with the, such uh, self-complementary designs, the input impedance is around 188 ohms as per Webner's principle. So we decided to select an RF transformer of one ratio three so that we could match a 50 ohm line to the uh, around 150 ohm antenna. So for the RS, uh, RF transformer, a mini circuits IC was selected. So this is the name of the IC. And we used an SSMA connector here uh, instead of an SMA to keep the ground plane as small as possible because all the radiation that passes through the ground plane is actually lost. So this is uh, the insertion loss of the RF transformer that we are using. So the maximum insertion loss that it uh, gives is point, uh, point 0.9 dBi. 
And the SSMA connector performance seems quite fine. So uh, it's quite, uh, quite less. And so we have uh, like ignored any loss due to it. So this was uh, the fabricated antenna. So in the middle here, we have this RF transformer that I'm talking about, and this is the SSMA connector. So this is the simulation in snow results for the spiral antenna. So uh, what we can see here that, so uh, I haven't like incorporated the insertion loss due to the RF transformer here. So this figure minus uh, 0.9 dBi will give us something between uh, 6.2 to 6.3 dBi. So that's uh, what the expected gain in snow would be. So it has a nice, this 3 dB angular width, uh, which is actually desirable because there could be some uh, lateral movements uh, if we deploy the equipment for longer time. And this is the simulated gain and S11 of the antenna. So uh, from 400 megahertz up to 540 megahertz, uh, it is able to maintain a good gain. And this is again the simulated gain, but now up till uh, 700 megahertz. So one thing I would like to mention is that the, the RF transformer that we are using, so it's only good for a range of 250 to 760 megahertz. So although the antenna uh, can perform better, but the RF transformer will limit its performance within this range. So for the uh, gain measurement, uh, I used two methods. So the first one was a three antenna method. And if I measure the, uh, if I get three measurements using a VNA, I can figure out the gain of each of them. So it is important here that the antennas are uh, in each other's uh, far fields. And to ensure that we, we need to keep the uh, separation distance between the ant antennas greater than uh, this figure here. So this uppercase D here is the uh, maximum linear dimension of either of the antennas. And we can measure the gain with two antennas as well, but then we need the same antenna, uh, two units of the same antenna. So both these methods were used. And this was some uh, improvised uh, way I put up the antenna with the quarter wave reflector. So this here is a uh, aluminum sheet measuring uh, 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter that I got from RS components. And this is a spiral antenna in front of them. And this is around 17.3 centimeter. Yeah, so a quarter wavelength. So these are these uh, two antennas facing each other. So I'm using the two antenna method here. And back there is the uh, VNA. And I'm getting the VNA display on a computer. So I couldn't uh, measure the antenna performance in snow, but uh, the method that I adopted was to simulate the same antenna in free space as well, and then compare my experimental results with the simulations in free space. So in free space, um, the antenna gives a very nice beam pattern, far field pattern, and the gain is around uh, subtracting the insertion loss from it comes out to be around 7.2 dBi. So these are the, uh, like the simulated and experimental results that are measured in free space with a quarter wave reflector. So the uh, gain uh, kind of matches the simulated, uh, simulated measurement and the maximum variation is not more than uh, half a dB. So this is the uh, experimental and simulator measurements over a longer range up to 700 uh, megahertz. So uh, 
the antenna actually starts performing badly after 540 megahertz, although I expected it to be uh, like performing fine up till 700 megahertz, but uh, perhaps it's because of the RF transformer that I'm using. So what I intend to do is test the performance of the transformer uh, separately as well, like put a 150 ohm uh, termination resistance on one side and then measure the resistance on the other so that I see that uh, what's the performance of the RF uh, transformer. And this is just some uh, measurements over, a, over the complete measurement range of the VNA. So from 400 megahertz up till four gigahertz. So from here, I can see that I have some usable range above one gigahertz as well as two gigahertz as well. And I did some uh, like measurements without the quarter wave reflector just to see that the uh, simulated results are able to match the measured ones. Because this is the basis I'm using to say that this antenna would be able to perform in snow as per the simulated results. So in, so without a quarter wave reflector, this is the uh, measured gain and below here is a simulated gain and uh, they tend to agree with each other. Yeah, so this is the same results over an extended range. And some of the short term future work that I have in mind is to uh, measure the quality of polarization of my antenna. So uh, it's supposed to be circularly polarized and I can do this by having like a printed cross dipole, uh, a printed dipole antenna and then rotating it and measuring the gain. So ideally I should get the same gain uh, once I rotate it in different angles. So I'll see how it goes. And so one of the other antennas that we had developed was this one uh, for the uh, probe. And so this antenna is sitting on top of the probe here. And this cover will then come on top. Uh, so for, uh, another work that I'm still working on is that I'm trying to simulate uh, this complete RF transformer in CST because the way I'm doing at the moment is that I'm using four ports to simulate this antenna and my simulated results do not exactly agree with the measured ones. So ideally what I would want is that I should be able to like simulate this complete RF board inside, uh, inside CST, and then perhaps the results would agree. And this is a picture of another antenna for the surface receiver that we made. So I want to uh, measure the performance of this antenna with a quarter wave reflector as well. So I have some measurements without a quarter wave reflector. Uh, but I'll do some measurements with the reflector as well. 